We have really come to the last three verses. Um, Over these weeks, we looked at the Spirit-filled wife and the Spirit-filled husband, and we want to kind of look at the consummation, the Spirit-filled marriage, the whole picture. But let's back up to verse 22, and as we come to that verse, we'll read to the end. Remember in 18, we were told that we should be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Verse 21, we should submit ourselves to one another, notice, in the fear of God, The wives part in that. The wives submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Now the husbands part in being submissive. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church." For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, in the most practical realm, let every one of you, and and verse 33 falls to all singulars, let every one of you individually and particularly so love his wife even as himself, and let every one of you wives individually and particularly see that she reverence her husband. We come now to the picture of the complete marriage. That we, we looked at the wife, we look at the husband. Now the marriage as a whole. And it tells us here it's a picture uh, of, of Christ and the church. It's, it's something mystical, not mythical. Mystical. And in the scripture, as we go through the scripture, there are three mystical unions that kind of are predominant. And one of those is three persons and one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That is a mystical unity or union. Uh, It is not mythical. It's mystical. It's a reality. The three in three persons, one God. Then there is, secondly, the union of Christ and human flesh, the incarnation God, God, the God man, you know, it is mystical, not mythical. It was God in human flesh. And then lastly, it is you and I, the, the, the union between Christ and the believer. We are his body. We are his bride. Listen, why are you in church? You know, why do we come? Well, it's something we're supposed to do. I hope that's, if that, I hope that's not the only reason you come, because if it is, we're kind of running out of gas here, slowly but surely. Ten years from now, there'll only be five of you coming, you know. Uh, you know, why do we come to church? Because it's what our denomination does. Uh, it, it's an organization. It's no, listen, this is what the Bible says. The church is the bride of Christ, You're part of something that is temporary in in its earthly manifestation. It is eternal in its reality. We are here now in our pilgrimage a reflection of something. And it says every one of our marriages is a picture of Christ and the church. The exhortation is to husbands and to wives allow that picture to be demonstrated in this world. Jesus is saying, I am above representing you there. You as husbands and wives, are be to be, you're to be below representing me there. And it is only temporary. When the trumpet blows, there is no more marriage. In heaven, you're not married. You're not given in marriage. So in this temporary journey, 
We are, under the lordship of Christ, to allow our marriages to be a picture, to reflect something. Because the world out there knows nothing about it. The st- you read the statistics on, on their marriages. They don't have any right to tell us about marriage. They don't even know what marriage is anymore out there. So here we are. You, Pastor Joe, this is tough. I know it's tough. Jesus, when he, when, he, when he talked to his disciples and he said, you know, no man should divorce his wife for any reason except for adultery. And the disciples said, man, if that's so, we probably shouldn't even get married. You got to stick with her for the rest of your life? Well, he's going to stick with us for eternity. We're his bride. And we are in this temporary existence to be a picture, an image of that. Look, it says this, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Some beautiful things here. Look, first of all, it says, And gave himself for it. Redemption. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, this is what you need to understand. He gave himself for you. You can refuse that. But he died on the cross for you. He laid down his life for you. He died in your place. He gave himself for you. That's not the end of the journey. And it's important for you to understand that because there are churches today, uh, particularly youth movements, where, where guys in the pulpit are saying, if you're, if you're a believer, don't come here. Our church is only for unbelievers. All we care about is people get saved. If you're already a Christian, go somewhere else. Where does that come from? Where is that taught in the Bible? It says here, there's a reason that Jesus gave himself. He didn't say that's the end game. I gave myself so that you might be saved. Now that you're in, you can do whatever you want because you're saved by grace and you'll get into heaven anyway and maybe with the seat of your pants on fire, but you're going to get there. It doesn't say that. It says he gave himself that. There's a reason that he might sanctify and cleanse by the washing of the water of the word. The reason that he gave himself that people would be saved continues that he might sanctify his bride, that he might set it aside. Every husband is to set his wife aside from all other relationships. Once you get married, that's the woman for you. You're to set her aside. She's to have a position that's unlike any other woman on the planet. We we see it in in Eden. You know, Adam takes Eve. Now, the most beautiful woman in the world. She was the only woman in the world. I mean, you know, but but she, she was set aside from all other women too, obviously. But, you know, that's the way it was from the beginning. He gave himself, the, the, you know, lays down his life sacrificially that he might sanctify his church. He wants our lives set aside from the world unto him. We're his. And that in growth he might wash us, cleanse us with the washing of the water of the word. That's his care for us. Listen, when I travel, you know, Kathy was with me in Southern California, but many times I'm in, I go to Israel or something, I'm to travel with our, I'm, I'm, I'm always glad when the guys on staff say, hey, look, when you're gone, if the roof leaks, those are the kind of things happen when I'm gone. You know, uh, you turn, like the Three Stooges, you turn on the light and water fills the light bulb. You know, those, just those kind of things, you know, happen. The hot water heater blows up. They always tell me, we got it covered. Don't worry. We got and I feel that means everything to me to know when I travel or I'm away somewhere that my bride is covered. And I have the incredible continual sense that my responsibility is to care for his bride until he comes. All I want to see in the Lord's eyes, I, I, I know, is I want his eyes to speak to me kind of and say, thanks, you took care of her. You fed her. You looked after her. You told her the truth when she didn't want to hear it. You told her what I said in a world that was telling her a million other stories. He gave himself that he might sanctify his bride and cleanse her through the washing of the water of the word that he might present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, holy and without blemish. In in the final analysis, that's what the church is going to be like. We're going to stand in front of him glistening, pure and white. Paul says to the Corinthian church, 
that I want to present you as a chaste virgin before Christ on that day. I might have said that to some other churches in the New Testament. The Corinthian church was famous for fornication, drunkenness, suing one another. They were a mess. But Paul says, I'm laboring here. I love you. And in my labor, I want to present you on that day as a chaste virgin before Christ. He understood the power of the blood that Christ had given himself. That the church would be sanctified, washed in the water of the word. And then one day presented glorious. Without spot, without wrinkle. That's what it tells us in Jude. That he might present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. Imagine that. We're going to stand faultless. Wives here today, the husband you're married to, whatever you can see is wrong with him, he's going to stand faultless before Jesus one day. Husbands, whatever you might want to gripe about your wives, you should stop. She's blood washed. He's going to stand faultless before his throne one day. And what he's asking us is that we would live that out here now, giving this lost world a picture of Christ and the church. Of Christ and the church. It says, verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherishes it even as the Lord the church. Interesting, in the the papyra, the Greek papyra, the ancient marriage contracts they found, they always include these two words, nourish and cherish. We would say feed and clothe. It was every husband's responsibility, even in ancient times, when he took a bride to himself to assume the care for her, to nourish her, to cherish her, to feed her and clothe her. It tells us the Lord has assumed that responsibility, certainly towards the church. In chapter 4, verse 11, it says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teaching pastors for the work of the ministry, the edifying the saints and so forth, that the Lord has made sure that his bride is getting fed, that he takes care of that, that he's given grace to the church and that there are teaching pastors, there are evangelists, and, and his bride is cared for by those he has given gifts to to do that very work. So no man has ever hated his own flesh. He nourishes it, cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church, for we are members of his body. Look what it says. Interesting of his flesh and of his bones. We're not just, this is not just theoretical or theological. It says there is an organic connection between you and I and Christ. Listen, in, uh, in the, in the garden of Eden, It says there that God created Adam after his own image and his own likeness. We see this spacesuit today fallen. Some of our spacesuits look better than others, but they're all wearing out. I'm not what you see. I live inside of this. It's going to be raised, incorruptible. My body's going to be fashioned like unto his glorious body, which means I'm going to be somewhere between 30 and 33 years old in the resurrection. I can't wait. It's way back at this point. Adam was created. Eve was not. She was made from Adam's body. She is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He who loves his wife loves his own. You love her like you love your own flesh because she is your body. Eve was taken out of Adam. There is some wonderful completeness in marriage when the husband and wife are joined spiritually, emotionally, physically. There is something of the coming back together of whatever that separation was. And this flesh that we live in is something that God gave to us. We are actually his flesh and his bone. 
He is now at the right hand of the Father in one of these spacesuits, blue-collar worker, a carpenter. He took this on forever. And ours are going to be raised incorruptibly once it presents us glorious, a glorious bride before his throne. And it says, it says there's a mystery in all of this. We are his bone and his flesh. Just imagine that. It's not just theoretical. It says here there's some organic mystery in this. It says it's a great mystery here. When we stand in front of him, he's going to be wearing Adam's DNA and genes and chromosomes. He took that on from Mary. The Holy Spirit impregnated the egg. There was no physical father. It was the father in heaven. But he put on skin. And he's wearing it today. And it is the same skin that we have from the days of creation, from our origin. And we're his very flesh and his bone. How remarkable. For this cause, verse 31, is really as far as we've come. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall be joined unto his wife. They too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Look, it takes us, this is taking us back to Genesis chapter 2. And isn't it interesting? Um, it says, For this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. They too shall be one flesh. It's applied there to Adam and Eve, but it doesn't apply. It's mentioned four times in the New Testament. It applies to us. Adam didn't leave his father in the sense that, that we do. Eve didn't leave her mother and father. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Now the cause is this. Again, in Genesis 2, verse 18, you follow God through the days of creation. It was good. Behold, it was very good. He's good creation. The first time we hear something's not good again in the Bible is God said it's not good for man to be alone. That's the first not good in the Bible. He looked at Adam in paradise. What did Adam know? Him and God in paradise. What could be wrong? God says not good for this guy to be alone. So I am assuming again, for every man in this room that is married, that at some point God looked at you and said, it's not good for this one to be alone. (laughs) He needs a helper. This guy needs some help. So I'll make one that's suitable. Who who said that amen? No, no. (laughs) Be careful. You know, one of those Pinocchio things might happen. Your nose might go boop. I'm going to make him a helper that's suitable for him. And, and God's involvement, again, the only thing we have from paradise is marriage. The only thing we have from before the fall is marriage. The only thing that was instituted that is still alive today is marriage. And it still remains the same. There are still three of you, the husband, the wife, and the Savior. Still three involved. For this cause, it says here, because we, are, because we are a picture of Christ and the church. Listen, that doctrine should fuel you. You gather here on Sundays and says not to neglect the gathering together of yourselves. Does it tell us that? What does it say? Especially as you see the day drawing near. Have you turned the television on this week and watched anything besides the World Cup? Have you watched the Middle East? Especially as you see the day drawing near. Do you see the day drawing near? Don't neglect the gathering together of yourselves, especially as you see the day drawing near. Because it says it's going to be the manner of some. This is what happens. We come, we get saved. Christ gave himself for us, but he wants to sanctify. He wants us to continue to grow through the washing of the water of the word. But we we come with excitement. We're first saved. Church is great. Sing songs. That's cool. This, that. And then as time goes on, we mature. We first come, we're in love with everybody, then our love turns to discernment. Instead of loving people, we start discerning things about them. We start to cool off, 
Then we become Sunday morning Christians. We don't come Wednesday night anymore. We don't come Sunday night or Monday night anymore. We don't come Tuesday morning. We don't, you know, once a week become once a week Christians. That's not what God has called us to. That's not, we don't come together because you're supposed to go to church on Sunday. You're the bride of Christ. You're the bride of Jesus Christ. You're making a temporary journey through this world, and you are to reflect glory. The unsaved world is to see us gathered together. It says when an unsaved person comes in and hears us sing, hears the word of God, sees the worship, their hearts should be overwhelmed. We're to gather because there is no other gathering like this, nor has there ever been in the history of humanity. In the natural, it says, for this reason, because we're a reflection with our wives and our husbands of the church, of this mystery of Jesus and the church. For this reason, shall a man leave his mother and father? There has to be severance. There has to be leaving. Your parents raise you. They instill values in you. They take you to church. They want you to be able to see and understand. And at some point, you know, you're raised in a Christian home, you make a decision. You make a decision, hopefully based on those values, based on the lordship of Jesus in your life, and you choose a spouse. You end up with someone. Not good that man should be alone. I'm going to make a... a helper for him. God brings Eve to Adam as he still brings people together today. He who has found a wife has found a good thing, has found favor from the Lord. For this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother. There's got to be severance. There has to be leaving shall cleave to his wife. The idea is permanence, acceptance. The husband and the wife are woven together into one being. The two are one flesh. Intimacy, an important part of marriage. Intimacy will never be what it should be unless there is the cleaving, the oneness, the acceptance. There's never going to be the acceptance there should be unless there's the severance, the leaving. Listen, there's lessons here, not just for the bride and the groom, for the parents also. Parents, let me talk to you. I I have two words of advice to you. Butt out. I say that lovingly. I've I've got married kids. You know, in, in the sense that, you know, once your son, your daughter make a decision and they're joined to a spouse, they become a picture of Christ and the church. They are no longer yours. They are his. It's wonderful when a young couple can come to godly parents and ask for advice, but it's terrible when parents are butting in and interfering with what they shouldn't be interfering with. Because they're his. He will teach them. They will make their mistakes like we did. They will learn. They will grow together. They'll argue. They'll cry. They'll make up. They're going to be in this process that we've been in. And we think we know better because we've been doing it much longer. When the grandkids come, grandparents, they are not your kids. You appreciate that when they go. You love to see headlights and taillights in that relationship. (laughs) Look, God didn't entrust them to you. He entrusted them to them. Meddling parents can be a disturbance in marriage. The same way as there shouldn't be another man in a relationship with a wife. There shouldn't be another woman in the relationship with the husband. Outside relationships can interfere with that relationship. Just like us and Jesus, other things that get in the way and interfere with our relationship with Jesus, it becomes idolatry. I don't think that the couple themselves should favor one family over another. You know, you, 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 you defer, you show deference to your spouse. They have a family just, you know, there should be mutual respect and care and concern. But the point is you have this new unit now. You have this new husband and wife, and they don't need meddling from outside because they have a covering. There is a third party, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
To reflect him properly, there needs to be the leaving of father and mother. Now look, it doesn't mean geographically. It doesn't mean there's some cold, callous attitude towards godly parents. No, that, that shouldn't happen at all. It, grandparents, parents, wonderful resource. Wonderful to be around. But the idea is that young couple realizes now this relationship takes priority over every other relationship I've ever known. And here's the important thing. For those of you that are married, you have kids. Your relationship with your spouse is more important than your relationship with your kids. And that can become idolatry also. The best thing your kids can see is you two committed to each other. Our kids, you know, I haven't been a perfect husband. And Kathy, you know. uh, (laughs) Just kidding. She was at first service. Uh, You know. But, but our kids got to watch us cry, fight, make up, go through hard things. You know, they've got to watch us through the process of life. And I am thankful, and I want to finish together with Kathy. Kathy. And it is the lordship of Jesus Christ that is central in our relationship. Most marital problems are lordship problems. If the wife is willing to be the Lord's wife in the marriage with the husband, not just the husband's wife, because if you're only his wife, all of your response will be to him, and he ain't perfect. He is. So the wife needs to be the Lord's wife in the marriage. The husband needs to be the Lord's husband in the marriage. You can't be just the wife's husband because she's not perfect. He is. He still makes the perfect contribution. Most marriage problems, lordship problems. This reason a man shall leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife. The two shall be one flesh. There's there's intimacy prescribed by God, designed by God to be enjoyed, to be a part of marriage, not to be used as manipulation, not to be defrauded, not to be saying no to somebody all the time. It's to be enjoyed. It's it's part of the fullness of marriage. And in it, there's a picture of Christ and the church. Now, he, he takes all of this. This is doctrine. This is, if you understand this, who you are, you are the bride of Christ. If you understand in your individual marriages, you are supposed to be his representatives below as he is your representative above. There in heaven, in his priestly role, he represents you there. And he's telling the father, no, that one's, I know the way they're acting today, but they're blood washed. They may not look like it, but they are pure. They are clean. They are perfect. And he's representing us there, and he asked us to represent him here. To let our marriages be a picture, a photograph of Christ in the church. He's given us his spirit, he tells us here as he begins. He's given us his word. And this is temporary. He's going to do that forever. This is what? For how many years are left? You watching the news today? Is the rapture going to come this week or next month or next year, 10 years from now? I don't know that. But this is temporary. Him representing us in heaven has to be way harder than us representing him here. Him convincing a holy father in heaven that we are spotless and pure, that's more miraculous than you and I reflecting him here. So as he comes to the end of this picture, in verse 33, he says, nevertheless. Okay, here's this picture of Christ in the church. Listen, when you get engaged, and that happens around here. I always hear young people say, all the guys in the church are weird. You know, the girls say that. All the girls in the church are weird. I'm thinking, we, we do 30 or 40 weddings a year. Somebody's finding somebody here somehow, you know. <laughs> uh, 
I, I appreciate somebody being appreciative. That's nice. <laughs> but when you become a bride, I'll tell you this, it will change your calendar. Oh, some things get crossed out, new things get written in, dates start to be put in place. You know, there's a wedding day, there's a reception, all money starts to get, all of this. Hey, we're the bride of Christ. That should change our calendars. It should change the way we live. When that, when that engagement happens, that person knows I am now for one person from now on. And we should know as the bride of Christ, we are for one from now on. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Our calendars should be made around him. The way we behave should be made around him. And this last exhortation in verse 33 should be done around him. Nevertheless, see to it that every one of you husbands individually so love his wife the way Christ loved the church. And more particularly here it says as his own body. Guys, husbands. But Pastor Joe, that's impossible. It is on your own. That's why it tells us in the beginning, be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. We have his spirit. We have his word. He's given us the resources. Love your wives the way Christ loved the church. Well, I would if she would submit to me. It doesn't say that. Christ laid down his life for us while we were yet enemies, it tells us in Romans. Shh, don't tell my wife that verse. I'm telling you what the Bible says. He laid down his life for us while we were at enmity with him. You love her. She's not perfect. If that was the standard, you'd be out of here. You love her. You lay down your life for her. You set her apart. You sanctify her from all other relationships in this world. You wash her with the water of the word. You nourish her, you cherish her. You feed her, you clothe her, you take care of her. If she senses that in you, it will be way easier for her to be submissive to you. And husbands, you lead by example, not by sitting in a chair giving directions. You lead from the front, not from the rear. Husbands, see to it that every one of you, as an individual, it doesn't matter what every other husband in this room is doing, What you need to do is love your wife as yourself. Likewise, wives, you're to see to it also. See that you reverence your husband. Now, here's the interesting part of that picture. Nevertheless, let the husbands love their wives as themselves. Every wife is a Greek scholar on that side of the sentence. Every wife knows it says, husbands, agape your wives. Right, ladies? You know that much Greek. He's supposed to love me the way Jesus loves me. He's supposed to love me with divine love. You know that. But but wives always know what their husbands are supposed to do. I have one. I have a license and everything. In fact, I've been married to two or three different women, all in one body (laughs) over the years. Wives know that it says husbands are supposed to agape them. Wives, on the other side of the equation, your responsibility is to see to it that you reverence your husband. How many of you know the Greek word for reverence? Well, it doesn't matter what it is, because if he loves me with agape, whatever that Greek word is, I'll, I'll do that. No. no. Well, you know what that word is? It's Phobia. <laughs> I, sadly, I know some of you are thinking that fits my marriage. No, no, no. <laughs> it's phobate here. It's a form of the word phobia. And it isn't certainly you're supposed to be afraid or terrorized by your husband. That's wrong. It should never be happening. The idea here is to speak well of, to admire, more than anything, to show deference to defer to your husband. Listen, there are wives that just do this about their husbands all the time. Well, you're supposed to submit to your husband. Well, Pastor Joe, you don't know what my husband's like. That's why I didn't marry him. I, I don't know what he's like. God knows what he's like. 
and he tells you this is what you're supposed to be in your part of the response of the, of the relationship. Show deference to him. One author says it means to listen and listen again. Because wives, you know, you go through the Bible, men are always warned about women. There's no place where women are warned about men. I mean, men are a dead giveaway. You don't have to figure us out. But, but men are warned about women. And my wife, you know, she can know I can be saying something, and before I'm done the sentence, she already knows what I'm trying to say and corrects it. <laughs> she helps me. It says here the wife should listen and listen again before she responds. Deference is to defer to the husband. Don't talk to him um, around other women. It says, uh, it says a woman who makes her husband ashamed is like rottenness in his bones. Men are made a particular way by God. Women need to be loved the way Christ loves the church. The husband needs the deference of the wife to fulfill his role. If you are always challenging him, you will wear him out. If the husband is always unloving to the wife, he will wear her out. Marriage describes first the spirit-filled wife, then the spirit-filled husband. And then the Lord says, look, this is a picture of me and my church. You guys don't know how much I love you. When you stand in glory, spotless, pure, and white, and you're rewarded for the things I did through your life, good works foreordained that you should walk in them. You're going to fall down. You're going to throw your crowns. You know, when you're there and you see me with the nail marks, the only man-made things in heaven are the nail marks in Jesus Christ. When you see me as the lamb that was slain, you're going to be filled with wonder. And what I want you to do is while you're making your temporary journey on earth, I want your marriage, if you're married, to reflect my relationship with the church. Husbands, I want you to do those things that reflect the love that I have towards my bride. And ladies, I want you to show reverence to your husband. Because any woman who's married who reverences me will demonstrate that reverence by reverencing her husband. Any husband who loves me will demonstrate the love he has for me by loving his wife. This is a lordship issue in the final analysis. Is it easy? No. The Bible tells us, uh, you know, dozens of things. It doesn't want us to get drunk. It doesn't want us to live in sexual sin. It gives us all kinds of prohibitions relative to this world, all kinds of instruction. When it boils down to the marriage, the home, God says, this is what I want it to look like. This, this is my diagnosis and my prescription for the home. As I deal in so many other areas of life, this is what I want for the husband and the wife. Husbands, love your wives. They need to be able to take a deep breath and feel like you're going to take care of them, that you want to be intimate with them, not just physically, just to, to care about them, to, to pay attention to them. Wives, your husband needs to know that you understand the, the position that Christ has asked you to be in and that Jesus is the Lord of your life And wives, the the way you demonstrate that in your marriage is by giving deference to your husband. You know, give your opinion. You know, just, but push, there should be no push and shove. When push comes to shove, the wife is to give deference to the husband. What do you tell me? That's Victorian. That's like something out of the Dark Ages. Wait, Wait a second. No, no. This is from glory, not from the Dark Ages. This is from the light. This is from eternity. Look at the world defining marriage and look at their divorce. Look at the divorce rate. Look at what's going on out there. Look at the abuse. Look at the broken homes. Look at the children that are sexually abused. Look at the people telling us that marriage is not between a man and a woman. Look at the world's doing. They don't have any right to tell us what our homes should be like. The one who paid for us in his own blood has every right to tell us what our homes should be like. 
And, and it's temporary. That's what he says. It's a, it's a temporary, you know, kind of demonstration to the lost world. It's to be a photograph. And it is to us. You think about it. Think about the, the bride on her wedding day in the white dress, the, the groom waiting. And in all of those things, you and I, in our minds, we think of the day when Christ comes for us. We always think, that's we're going to be like that bride in glistening white standing in front of him. He's going to be, you know, the groom. And only the, the difference in the wedding is the groom comes down the aisle in that wedding. They sing, here comes the groom, not here comes the bride in that one, you know. He's, he's the center of everything. And we should live our lives now, hey, hey, reflecting that. Well, why, you know, tell me about your marriage. Why are you and your husband? Why? Because this is what the Lord wants. This is what he asks of us. This is how he wants me to treat my husband. And I see my husband as a, as a gift from the Lord. This is how he wants me to treat my wife. And you know what? The Bible says, I found a wife. I found favor from the Lord. She's a demonstration of the favor of Almighty God in my life. Easy? No. You think this is tough? Come next week. Come to child raising next week. <laughs> you know, you think that you have to lay down your life for your wife? You think that's dying? That's step one. When the kids come, there's a whole other level. You know, laying down your life so, so that others can be benefited and can live. Uh, but a blessing, a blessing, unimaginable in all of that. So uh, I want you guys, look. Sometime today, married folks, I think every husband in this room, you're sitting, oh, here he goes, your wife's already hitting, you know. Look, I think every husband in this room at some point today, if you have a worthwhile, you love your wife, worthwhile, I think you should say to your wife, you know what, honey, forgive me. I need to be a better husband. I need to be more like Jesus. I think every wife in this room at some point today should say to her husband, you know what, I I don't want to challenge you on everything. I I want to show deference. I don't want to wear you out. I want to be an encouragement. I think that's good stuff. That's good stuff. And if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. (laughs) Let's stand and pray. Father, we know that you want us to be a culture unlike any culture in this world. You want our homes to be marked and unlike any homes in this world, Lord. We think of the the children of Israel locking the doors and putting the blood of the lamb on their lentil and on their doorposts and inside the home feasting on the lamb. Lord, make our homes like that. Lord, let our homes be marked with your blood, Lord. Let us inside, Lord, be feasting on the Lamb together as a husband and wife, as a family, Lord. Let us always remember, Lord, you gave yourself for us. That you might set us aside from worldly standards and worldly methods, Lord. That you might sanctify us and wash us, Lord, in the water of your word, Lord that your ultimate desire for us is that we would be glorious, glorious. And Lord, our hearts are filled with those things. Give us grace, Lord. You walked in our skin. You're a high priest. You can be touched with all of our infirmity and our weakness, Lord. Help us to be better husbands, better wives, Lord. We look to you. And we trust that pleases you, Lord, that we're praying according to your will. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen.